Okay, so um, just to make this uh, a little bit more explicit, because I've seen this come up in, a, in the questions before, what we're drawing on is a document that is very close to publication, D6.3. Uh, I think you've seen that referenced. Um, so uh, it's on its way, folks. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the section out of that where we talked about using uh, ethics by design as a general methodology for embedding ethical considerations into the development of products and of technologies. So for those of you who um, didn't see our presentations on this yesterday, basically what it is, as, as I've got the quote there, is it's a way, it's a system for trying to embed ethical thinking throughout the entire technology development process. Um, and I'll talk about the different levels with which that works. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid the situation which we've seen throughout history, which is we create a technology to do a particular purpose, and along the way it produces accidental and unanticipated uh, ethical problems. So the solution, we think, is to see if we can get people to anticipate those problems before they complete the construction of the technology, and not just in an abstract sense. We're not asking that every technologist become an ethical philosopher. What we're trying to do is provide them with a structure which provides guidance, which provides tools and so on. And um, as it says on the slide, we're not, we're not thinking that this is the be all and end all of every possible concern, but we are working on the basis that a lot of the problems that we have seen in the past could have been anticipated if people had, made a structured and a formal effort to think about how things might be misused, to consider dual use, to consider unanticipated consequences, um, to consider how people who are not necessarily interested in making the world a better place might misuse a technology and so on. So as it says, some thought during the development process is better than none at all. So. There's a process to building this that we've developed within um, the Siena project and which we think is generalizable to a wide range of technologies. So the first thing you have to do in order to have an ethics regime is you have to have some ethical values, for example, freedom, transparency, and so on. From those values, you can then examine a piece of technology or a branch of technology and to determine what we call ethical requisites. These are characteristics that it must possess in order to either avoid violating the values in the first instance and then possibly supporting or enhancing them. And that is possibly a little bit more controversial. There is definitely a debate between those who believe that in order for something to be ethically sound, it must promote positive values versus those who are simply concerned to make sure that it's not actually doing any harm. But certainly in the first instance, the key criteria for an ethical requisite is that it defines an aspect of the technology such that it won't violate a particular value. And then what we want technologists to do is we want them to take these requisites, these characteristics, things, sometimes very basic stuff like the technology must not via, uh, destroy human freedom and turn those into exactly the same type of design requirements that they are used to dealing with anyway. All technologies have a design requirement of being reliable. Most of them have a requirement of being efficient. And these are things that are an inherent part of the thinking during the creation of the technology. They're not external factors that are brought in after the effect and so on. They are simply in there along with the maths and the material science and whatever else must be going on. So this is what we want to do. We want to make ethics just another characteristic of a desirable technology. So 
the requisites are, design, are defining the overall characteristics of the technology that keep it within line with the values that we're talking about. We then, from those, develop what we call ethical guidelines. And this is where we're getting very, very specific. An ethical guideline is a task. It's a task that has to be undertaken during the development of a technology or a product in order to create an end result that matches our ethical requisites. So in order to do this, you, you do need a structured understanding of what the technology is. We used what we call ant anticipatory ethics for emerging technologies, which divides a technology into a series of layers. So at the broad level, we have the overall description of the technology. This is where we'll see things like common concepts, maybe materials if those are relevant, particular production processes, uh, certainly the aims and the goals of a technology, what it's designed to do. And there may be ethical issues that arise at that level. Those are used to create products. So these are devices or processes, particularly as we see in um, genomics work, a lot of the quote unquote products are actually processes that can be that then be used. We see this in other branches of engineering. So again, there will be ethical concerns that are particular to the product. They're not inherent to the technology in and of itself. And then finally, as we now know, um, particularly from what we've seen on the internet, people may not use the product in the same way. So the same product can be used, can be applied in different ways by different people. And so sometimes the ethical concerns are with how it is used rather than the product or the technology in and of itself. So what you've got then is you've got a series of values, you've got a series of requisites, and you've got a definition of the technology so that you can determine at which level within the technology structure, the guidelines, the individual tasks need to be applied. Now, we're not advocating that you use our particular model. I'm sure there are plenty of other models, but we've found this one to be particularly effective. And I do need, think you need some way of distinguishing between the general characteristics of a technology and the products that are produced from within it and especially how it is used. So you then need a model of the development of technologies and products themselves. We have what we call the generic development model. It's what's worked for us. It in, in a, enables you to structure up the, the process of development so that you can determine at which point particular guidelines, particular tasks need to be applied. So we have what we consider to be a fairly generic and uncontroversial model of how products are developed, starting from specifying what it is that you want the thing to do, going through the resources you need, through to a high level architectural design, then there's um, some form of data manipulation or collection and so on. It may be aerodynamic calculations that you need to do if you're building uh, an aircraft. It may be data preparation if you're building an artificial intelligence, but there is some form of work with data. And then there's the actual process of construction itself. And finally, hopefully they're tested before they're released out into the marketplace and so on. And so what we're trying to do is pin the, te the, the requirements to these different phases in the, generic, in the generic model. And as I say, there may be other models that are more or less applicable. When it comes to generalizing this process, there are two elements to the generalization. One is the first stage of what I've described, which is this process of going from values through to requisites to tasks. You can draw the values from existing sources. Other initiatives working in this, uh, such as the uh, P7000 initiative from IEEE, actually talk about mechanisms by which you would develop your values. And then the second issue is the application of either our generic development model or uh, an, an alternative. 
And then you can, once you've got your two structures, you've, your, you've got your values, your requisites and your tasks, and you have a development model, you're in a position to start applying specific requirements to a specific technology. We are very satisfied that the generic development model will work for any software driven technology. It's a, it, it are ideally suited for software development. It worked extremely well for our analysis of artificial intelligence. I've done some work looking at it in mechatronics, which is where we're building things like intelligent prosthetics. So they combine mechanical, elect uh, electronic and biological components. Again, it works very well there. It seems to work pretty well for biochemical engineering. And in general, it seems this the generic development model seems to work fairly well for emerging technologies. We're pretty clear that it'll work for most branches of engineering, but there are, it may be a little bit more nuanced for mature technologies. For example, things like cars today, we're not really seeing radical changes in technology from product to product. It's a very, very incremental process. And then, of course, we also have technologies which aren't used in the way that they were originally designed. Uh, so these are uh, technologies where people find unexpected uses, dual uses, um, and so on. But the general process it, it seems to work very well. You go from your values to your requisites to your tasks. You, you have a, a model of the technology, which you can then use as a basis for developing a, a development model. And then you can start slotting in individual requirements that technologists uh, um, need to undertake in order to produce the ethical status that you're looking for in your technology. Um, so um, the real, uh, I think that really bring, I've so, sort of summarized this all, already um, but I've got a simple example there so a typical example that we would expect to see in most technologies is that of safety uh, the requisite the requisite the characteristic is very simple the product should be safe to use and so the, if it was a piece of machinery the guideline might very well be something as simple as once the initial design is completed test it for compliance against a particular safety standard 